I am John Edward Graybill. I'm a professional photographer, member of Professional Photographers of America. And Edward Curtis is my great-grandfather. This year was significant as it would have been my great-grandfather's 150th birth year. Welcome to the Seattle Art Museum and uh, we're excited to see the exhibit on double exposure and it starts uh, down here on the main floor even before you get tickets and there's a wonderful timeline so there's a timeline of all the events, major events of Curtis's life that uh, led to this whole project of the North American Indian on the bottom and on the top part of double exposure is a timeline of a lot of the things that were going on with the Native Americans during that same time. So it's sort of just for me and for my two sisters and my wife, we've always dreamt about visiting here in Seattle, where Curtis' studio was, where he lived, where he worked, and where it all started. And so we decided to visit Seattle for that celebration, the 150th year. And there was many places that we were going to visit while we were here that we were very excited to see, including the Seattle Art Museum exhibit called Double Exposure. And this is a fascinating display of not only Curtis's work, but several other Native Americans' current artwork in the 21st century. We got a wonderful tour and had the pleasure of meeting Barbara Bretherton, the curator of this exhibit. Double Exposure is a new look at Edward S. Curtis and his legacy in the 21st century. The complete title is Double Exposure, Edward S. Curtis, Mary Ann Nicholson, Tracy Rector, Will Wilson, a group of four artists who deal with Native American subjects and Native American topics. And I think it gives us a unique look at Edward S. Curtis' work, but also a chance to look at the important and impactful work that's being done by living Native American artists and photographers. For our public opening of Double Exposure, we had a very festive Native gathering. We had a Native art market with artists doing a whole variety of artworks, weaving and jewelry making. And then we had uh, dance performances, one with the Muckleshoot Canoe Group. And then we also had the Lummi Blackhawk dancers. This is a wonderful piece done by Marianne Nicholson. Uh, the three artists we have in the exhibition are from different parts of Native uh, North America. The first artist is Marianne Nicholson, who is from the Kwakwakiwak Nation. She started out as a photographer, but more recently she has been doing elaborate light pieces, sometimes with monumental glass features. For this exhibition, we have a work by Marianne called The Seam of Heaven. I wanted to create a piece that articulated an indigenous perspective of our relationship to place. So Curtis photographed indigenous peoples in many places, but what's missing from those images are the concepts and ideas that indigenous peoples held about those places. So I wanted to articulate a perspective on uh, the land and a, and a river system. And in this case, I'm talking about the Columbia River and how a modern colonial state system has divided that river into two separate states. And so I wanted to consider the Kwakwala concept of our relationship to the environment around us. And we spoke about the Milky Way as like a river of stars. Could we divide the Milky Way in the same way that the United States of America and Canada have divided the Columbia River. The second artist is Tracy Rector, a local filmmaker who uses film for Native people to be able to tell their own stories. And these films include a love poem to the environment, 
especially the Salish Sea, and also a very exciting virtual reality piece. Curtis's legacy presents multiple challenges and opportunities because it's a complicated history, it's a complicated legacy. His images have done much to anchor Native peoples in a historic past, but his work also helped to transform humanistic eye into the Native person in their home, which I think at the time was fairly forward-thinking. So this exhibit is a great opportunity for Seattle to be forward-thinking. And when people come to this exhibit, I hope they're inspired to learn more about contemporary Native peoples, as well as historic Native creatives who have been doing all sorts of creative mediums over the last 150 years as well. Can I ask you guys to read back to you about like, right here? The third artist is Will Wilson, who is Diné, and he is primarily a photographer, inspired by the question he asks, what if Native people had the camera and the tools to make images of themselves at the time Edward Curtis was making images. How would those images look? Would they be considerably different? And so with that, he uses a wet plate technology, which is a 19th century technology, and he creates tin types. So next we'll uh, go over to this uh, talking tin type, which is pretty spectacular because one of the things that I've always wondered about the Curtis images is what were these people thinking and what was their experience and what would they say to us if they could? The incredible stories they could tell I'm sure would be mind-blowing. So we decided to create what are called talking tintypes um, and so I'm using this technology, this augmented reality layer app to kind of give voice to the photographs. So you can scan these still images and they come to life and they, they talk to you. I was fortunate to grow up with my, my grandmother here in this picture, and she played the role of Princess Nada in Edward S. Curtis's In the Land of the Headhunters. That's just amazing. I love that. <laughs> yeah, Isn't that cool? You like that? Yeah, that is just really a neat way to explain. So here's uh, Curtis's image over there. <laughs> There are over 150 works by Edward Curtis in this exhibition. And our purpose was to give visitors an opportunity to see all the different media in which he worked, including hand-colored lantern slides, rare prints in platinum process. We also have a collection of the gold tones, the oratones, from an important private collection. And these are negatives on glass, burnished with bronzing powders to make them look golden. And then we have a group of wonderful rare images in their original frames from Seattle's Rainier Club, where Curtis stayed after he and his wife Clara separated. And because he didn't have money, he paid for his lodging with these images. I've actually been in that spot. Me too. Yeah, it's kind <laughs> yeah. of special. Only the only the rivers. He wrote it down a fair amount. Yes. the trees have grown trees. up. Yeah, it sounded to me like he. Took we also have cyanotypes that he made in the field. These are kind of throwaway images that were just developed using the sun, but they would give him a sense of the composition and the lighting. I've seen some that he had done in the field where then he'd have his notes all around the borders for when it went back to the lab in Seattle to his studio of lighten and darken and things that he wanted the technician to do. We also look at Curtis as an innovator. He created hundreds of sound recordings in the field using a wax cylinder recording method, mostly of native songs and native language. So in the exhibition, we have a selection of 30 that an audience can listen to. Well, the next uh, thrill is to see Edward S. Curtis's camera. 
This is the Century 1902 camera, six and a half by eight and a half. So he had larger cameras, but this is the size that he used the most because it was a little more mobile. The Agfa tripod is also original, so that's his tripod. And here's the letter of authenticity from Magnuson would be your something-in-law. Uncle Mag. Uncle Mag. <laughs> Uncle Mag, you called him. Uncle Mag uh, says that this was his workhorse camera because yes. it was a little Thanks. more mobile than the others. Just think about where that camera has been. That you know? camera has been from the Mexican border to the <laughs> oh. top of Alaska, so yes. I know oh. it. One of the things I value the most about the exhibition is that what it provides is an opening for people to think about Curtis differently and to think about the way that images of Native people impact Native people today and to think about how Native people are creating their own archives and are self-representing in ways that are authentic. When I think about Curtis, I think, you know, there's these kind of beautiful, soft-focused, sepia-toned images, and it's a way to bring people in and get them to understand that there's, like, a lot of complex histories and stories behind each of these images. And through Curtis, Seattle and a community is kind of made to remember who the original folks of this, this region were. Curtis was the documenter of an amazing people. There is a huge number of amazingly talented indigenous creative people, not only in the Pacific Northwest, but in these lands now called the United States. And this exhibit offers the opportunity for the broader public to become more familiar with native talents in terms of installation art, filmmaking, photography, and many more wonderful insights into Native creativity. It's tremendously important to have Indigenous voice within uh, modern contemporary spaces to uh, express Indigenous concepts and ideas. So I'm very grateful when I see the articulation of those ideas by Indigenous peoples in these spaces. It's very important today to have those conversations in terms of going forward with developing a new relationship between Indigenous peoples and colonial peoples. In my visit here for the 150th anniversary of my great gramps birth here, it's very refreshing to see Native Americans thriving and producing art and being a big part of society here in this town. I'm glad to see people opening dialogue and discussion based on Curtis's work and uh, trying to understand the meaning and comprehend what my great-grandfather had done. I feel in my heart he tried to understand Native Americans in an intimate way and bring that to life through the volumes of work and his photographs. He saw a very proud people and documented them and I see, a, again, a very proud people that is resurging and becoming more prominent in today's society. They didn't vanish. They've survived, and they're very strong in today's world.